Hello, hello. I don't know what happened to my intro. I think I might have turned it off and forgotten to turn, <laughs> turn it on. So I'm actually a minute early. Dungeon Master Masterclass, welcome. Says, uh, you like the idea of this topic? Awesome. I like it too. This is episode two or class two as I'm trying to get more scholastic with my naming conventions. We're talking about X crawling 101. Oh, no, nothing. Yes, you should definitely always pretend you can neither see nor nor hear me. Hey, Ovaltine Patrol. So, yeah, missed the intro, so I'm just, I'm live in it. Uh, yeah, welcome. This is uh, episode two, class two of Hexcrawl 101. This really should have been class one. Uh, you know, I think of things sometimes in a, uh, not the, not the, not the most efficient way. And so in this case... I kind of went into I just was so excited by the the prospects of this course, if you will, that I went rattling ahead talking about stuff when when maybe we, we should talk about something very central, which I think is a question that is important to a lot of folks. It, it trips people up, maybe, or they, they find themselves in a situation where in, in which they're not sure why they're doing this. You know, they're wondering how, how, you know, like David Byrne might have said, like, how, how did we get here? Right. Uh, so I thought it was a good question we should delve into. Again, should have been, should probably have been question one, but, you know, it is what it is. So, and the question is that I'm dancing around. Why are we hex crawling? Why, why are we doing a hex crawl? Now, I'm coming at this as with most things from the, a, the, the very game master centric point of view. For the players, I really don't think that they should be in awareness so much and therefore like, ooh, we are entering the hex crawl portion of the adventure. In a different video when we talked about differentiating between dungeon crawling and hex, and hex crawling, I, I really think that from a player's perspective, it should feel pretty seamless. I, in, from the player's perspective, what are you doing? We're traveling, we're on an expedition, we're, running away from something we're trying to find something not okay now we are dungeon crawling and now we are hex crawling to me those are really these are meta meta terms the players really should be concerned with just the nature of the activity themselves you're not dungeon crawling you're exploring this underground space or you're wandering through a, a what you think is an abandoned tower or something of that nature and then yeah when you're in the wilderness you're trying to get some there you're trying to find something you're trying to do something from the Dungeon Master's perspective, having those these different classifications is helpful because there are different processes, procedures, mechanics, tools we may want to use whether we are in the dungeon or whether we are in the wilderness or whether we're doing doing something else. But ultimately, it seems to me what's coming up is folks get into it and maybe they don't understand why or some of the things that we may ask them or suggest or say, hey, these are kind of hex crawling things to do. And in a situation where like, well, I'm doing these things, but I'm not sure why I'm doing them. Or does it make sense that I'm doing things like this? And part of that may be that maybe you're hex crawling when you don't need to be, or maybe your group isn't really into it, or maybe it's just that something that is, it's not, you're trying to use the tool because maybe you as a GM really like the concept of hex crawling. So you're trying to maybe wedge it in somewhere where, in a place where it's maybe not the best fit for what you're trying to do. So the first thing I think is to ask ourselves or really think about, well, why are we, why are we doing this? Why are we hex crawling as opposing to, as opposed to doing something else? And those something else's could be point crawling, could be simple passing over. We're just going to narrate entirely. We're going to do the Indiana Jones red line moving across the map and just saying, okay, you're here. And then, wavy hand wavy lines a couple of star wipes and now you're somewhere else or not even doing that much and just saying great three weeks later you show up at blank spot so why are we hex 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 crawling uh, iron caster says i feel like i'd take hex crawl and turn the whole thing into it into the top into too much of a board game we can get into that because I, I I don't think there's really a bad way to do it i know some folks are really they get into like i don't want it to turn into a board game I know that some of the original folks, that's how they did it, right? It was part of that, oh, I should have gotten it out. The They had the map uh, with the, the Avalon Hill game, Outdoor Survival. And I think some people had literally moving a pawn or some of the marker kind of across the map. 
And someone mentioned this in the comments, either to the Q&A video or one of the other videos. And I said that, hey, I'm not against that. It just gives a different vibe. You can really look at it and say, we want to take this kind of tactical, maybe even strategic view of the landscape in, in, in which maybe as the, the players, the characters, they have some kind of overall map. And it's almost like what you see in scenes in a war game or a war circumstance when the general moves, moves the pawn. Hold on one second. <coughs> Still fighting through my cold. Apologies in advance. Moves the pawn and slides it with that slider thing they have and, and pushes it to a space and maybe you, you see some other forces and they're pulled into other spaces to show their movements you could totally have that vibe i actually think there's a lot that role-playing games could borrow from board games especially the more modern board games that can really give it a great feel especially when you're playing in person having the kind of props and sort of things out that board games obviously are into because they in their very name there's a board and usually or some kind of layout and things that are very visual that even if we're playing, we're not playing in Roll20 or some fancy virtual tabletop that we could avail ourselves of. But we can get in that a little bit a little bit later. Uh, the Gorgon Patreon says, uh, just make Hex Crows non-player forward. Absolutely. I think, and for the most part, they shouldn't be. Right, The players should not be conscious about moving through hexes. or do, They should just be conscious of where they're, what's happening to them, how much time is passing, and the consequences of kind of their decisions. But as a GM, I think sometimes we end up being in a hex crawl when maybe we don't want to be or when it's not actually appropriate. So getting back to this central question of well, why are we hex crawling? To me, when I, when I think of hex crawling, the things that I'm thinking of why we're kind of doing this, can I get in here? I guess I can, is there's a focus on exploration. And I'm going to put another one here. I'm going to sneak it in here, right? Ugh, spelling. Why are we hex crawling? Hex crawling is really all about exploration and navigation. I think what happens is GMs will end up in a spot where you're hex crawling across and, and they're traveling on a, a very well-known road from two very well-known places. And, and, and then you get the situation of, well, why am I using, what are these rules? Do these rules make sense if we're traveling on a road? No, they don't really, for the most part, make sense. I mean, encounters can make sense. Just because it's a road doesn't mean there are no encounters. I, I would say that very often doesn't even mean that there's less encounters because usually in the wilderness, at least the I play, there's not a lot of encounters anyway, but just maybe the nature of those encounters changes. But no, if there's a well-known road that travels in an unbroken line from A to B, there's not really much hex crawling going on. You're not, you're, you're not really hex crawling. You are literally doing kind of that point crawl. You're starting with A and you're working along a path to B. So if you're in the situation where you're a GM and you're like, okay, my players are moving and there's this road that leads exactly to where they want to go. Some of this hex crawling stuff doesn't make sense. And the answer is, yeah, it, it might not because it, generally speaking, in terms of the overall hex crawl, it, it's not, roads aren't really the thing. The whole point, the whole consequence of getting lost, the whole idea is how much you do about kind of navigation, about trying to figure out your landmarks, about moving making those decisions and having to having to deal with the fact that we don't really know where we're going is because you don't have this nice road that <laughs> leads you exactly where you're going you are exploring navigation you either you you may know that okay we need to get from a to b and i know that b exists and i kind of know roughly where it is in the the grand scheme of things for example i'm in the united states and i'm in new york and i know that roughly if i go west all the way California, somewhere, somewhere over there. Sure. But how, how efficiently I can get to California? Can I get there without murdering myself or the rest of my party, either through just hazards, natural hazards, or through whatever flora and fauna may be out to get me, not to mention other people. Those are the kind of things that are all about hex crawling. If I'm really just going to get on the highway and just drive straight across. When I lived in Texas, I knew that I was in Houston. If I get on I-10 and I follow I-10 all the way through, I'm getting to Los Angeles. I don't need to do anything. I just need to get on I-10 and not get off until I see signs for Los Angeles exits, whatever to whatever. I don't need to do hex crawling there. I really, it's, it's at that point, the adventure insofar as the travel between Houston and Los Angeles is about what funny, wonderful, weird, crazy, outlandish things I might see on on i-10 and whatever natural obstacles exist in i-10 and if you've ever driven on i-10 for any length of time you know that those obstacles 
are numerous. Hey, Laurel Li I'm Liete says salute from Brazil or salute. Well, either way, welcome. Gorgon Patron says that's how I'm running my current hex crawl. They have a party token and movement on the map, pushing away the fog of war. Yeah, I think that's a totally reasonable way of doing it. There's really no wrong answer. I mean, ultimately, the answer to all this stuff is whatever works for you and gets you and your players where you're going. I, I'm not a guru. I'm not here to tell you there's the one true way. These are just things that I've done that have worked for me, either as I've played through them or have run them, and that I feel like sharing with you. But ultimately, take this stuff and tear it up, destroy it, remake it in in your image. Ultimately, it really just matters as if this enables you. The extent this stuff is useful is how much it enables you to do the things you're doing. And if you're ever looking at something and say, well, the hex crawl procedures say do one, two, and three, but one and two don't seem to apply to me, should I still do them? The answer is no. If you don't think they apply, don't do them. But I think in, the, in regards to the, the question of today's episode, if you find that none of the things are really fitting your situation, don't shoehorn them in just because we're hex crawling. Do the things that make sense. And in the case of a road, if you have a road and you're or anything and you're looking at it like this, like the example I've used a lot. Hey, we just need to get the Lonely Mountain. We don't care where we get on Lonely Mountain. We just need to get there. Then certain challenges, certain parts of the hex crawl, depending on where they are in Middle Earth, may not make sense. If you're in the part where we've crossed over the Misty Mountains and we've crossed through uh the, the the forest and i'm spacing out the name of the forest we <laughs> cross through murkwood and and now we get to this point where literally there's no you know you you can't look if you, unless you're facing completely away from it there's no way you could look and not see misty and not see the lonely mountain at that point a lot of the navigational things of will you find the lonely mountain or not no it's, it's there we can't possibly miss it then the questions might be, well, there's still efficiency. The navigational questions are still there. How efficiently you can get there? How much can you miss danger? And there is no road. So it, some, ways may be, some ways may be easy or difficult. Maybe you're running out of food. Maybe you're running out of other resources. Maybe there's a time limit. Remember in The Hobbit, they were on a time limit. They had to get, they had to, get to the Lonely Mountain by the new moon. So while we don't have the, the getting lost part might not make sense in the, in the macro sense, if you're not going to lose the Lonely Mountain, but you might lose that best way there. You might end up in swamps. You might end up in other weird spots where, sure, you know how to get there. You, you could see ultimately your destination, but it's not clear. So we, you take the situation and you look at it and you break down what are the things we need to do or, or what, are the, what are the mechanics that are going to make sense for this? What are the mechanics, mechanics may not make sense for it? And if you get to this point where you're scratching off mechanics and say, sorry, well, navigation, they're just going to follow the road. That's not a thing. They're not exploring anything. That's not a thing. The hazards they have aren't ones that really are about making any of those decisions. That's not a thing. The efficiency is really just about how quickly they move on the road. And the party's just going to say, as quick as we can. That's not really a thing. Then maybe you say, okay, this is not really a hex crawl appropriate. This is more of a point crawl. There's going to be some obstacles. We're going to, there might be some encounters on the road, but the question isn't about, can we, can we get there or not? Maybe can we get there? It's not the right way to put it. Maybe, uh, can we find the place? It's not a question. So maybe hex crawling isn't isn't the thing. Brian Smith says, so I shouldn't hex crawl my upcoming masquerade ball I prepared. Yeah, I mean it could be big. I mean it might be uh, it might be it might be if it's large scale maybe. Or your hexes are like five feet wide. Maybe you're going to do everything as a I'm going to hex crawl through this masquerade. You know, with five foot five foot hexes might work. Um, Brian Smith says, I like the point crawl concept from the player side. Travel my landmark is pretty natural, and the map hex crawl is kind of like 75% on the GM. Uh, yeah, I, I would guess so. Though remember, you have to have those landmarks first, and oftentimes you might not have them. And that's where the hex crawling part could come in, because then it's like, find the landmarks. You have a map to where it potentially could be the Lost Gut Dutchman Mine, and the Lost Dutchman Mine map says, turn left at the rock that looks like a face. But you're in the you're in the desert and the superstition mountains. There are lots of rocks that may look like faces. So you got to try to find the right one, the one that might match some other contextual clues, none of which are obvious until you actually get there and look at them. Finding those landmarks is the hex crawl. Once you've got all those and you've chained them together, you've written them down and put it on your own map, or you figured it out. Then after that, it's is a kind of a point crawl, unless somebody comes and dynamites one of your landmarks or something, and otherwise obfuscates the trail you've made after you've after you've made it 
Loro says, five miles like Dark Sun map is about exactly eight kilometers, making easy conversion. I didn't know that. I never thought about the kilometer thing. That's a good point. I Five or six mile hexes, they all they both work fine for me. But that is a, a point in favor of the five mile hexes. I don't know anyone's brought up, which is if they do convert cleanly to kilometers, which is handy. Let's see. MB says, in my mind, having the party look at the hex map in front of them makes the stakes more tangible and takes a bit of the weight off the DM. If that's what helps, you know, if that works for you and and your and your sense, and it may very well be a matter of that context, because the nice thing about a hex crawl or a hex map, and I'm going to zoom in here so we can take a good look. This is the this is the map from the Isle of Dread, but the Goodman Games version. Let me just zoom in here so we could see it. If you are listening to this later, I know this will have. Oh, I don't want to move it. I just want to move. Here, oops. Oh, I lo they lost me. Okay, there we go. We're back. The nice thing about a hex map, if you do choose to show with your players, to your players, is that it's all abstract. So they're not getting any real eyes on the ground, ground level intel. They're getting more high level intel. And because all this hex stuff is all fuzzy anyway, you know, the, the, this is not, the, the, so where I'm looking at the Isle of Dread map, <coughs> excuse me. And we might see here, oh, look, there's a uh, there, there's a, a village here in this little hex down here. And then there's another village here. That doesn't tell you, you know, we have, this is, uh, I forget how big these hexes are. I think in Isle of Dread, they may be five or six miles. Those are 30 square miles worth of island or worth of peninsula that you're, that this village is on. It doesn't magically give you the fact that you know where the village is. Now, you know their vill a village is there. So you're, I guess you have a leg up that way. But other than that, it's still up to you to find it. And of course, if you get lost, you end up wandering into one of these other hexes and you miss the village entirely. Maybe you only find, you find the path and then you, you then now you have to determine whether you want to go backwards and, and spend more valuable time to try to find the village that way. Or maybe take it forwards and see if you can find this other village, which would probably be easy if you're on the path, since presumably the path goes right to the village. Juan Cholo, hey Juan, says maps with vague directions in here there be dragon areas are great for hex crawling. Yes, and, and I am totally in favor of figuring out a way to give your players some kind of map. I think I've mentioned this a few times in my games. I've given my players maps, but they're kind of very vague, very non-accurate in terms of fine navigations, just maps of their kind of starting area. And it just gives them a couple of things so they can kind of look and see it. And I do agree that it can really give them sort of a, a sense of place. And it's, and it's the scale. I'm not giving them a blown up scale of the entire campaign world. It's like three hexes, but they have a concept, which I think is enough for their locality. Like, what would these people know? They would know, okay, there's town here, town here. Yeah, there's hills. You can see the hills. Okay, and there's forest. You can even see parts of the forest. But they don't really know much other than that, but it does ground them. Now, granted, I'm not giving them maps with the hex hex markers on them or anything like that. But if you chose to do that and you wanted to have them literally with a pawn, either uh, physically or in a virtual sense, moving pawns around and that helps them. I'm totally, like I said, if it helps them and you don't find it odious for whatever reason, and I'm not saying it is odious, but just it doesn't, it's not something that upsets you to do and it helps them, then, you know, go for it. What I wanted to point out looking at this Isle of Dread map is here we have this hex map. Isle of Dread is one where I believe the backstory, it's been a, it's been a minute since I've looked at it. I think you end up getting shipwrecked on the island. You're looking for some kind of treasure, I think, or you, you've gotten a map or you got a hold of something that's got some kind of treasure. Some other thing like, hey, go here and find it. And I believe you get on your way to finding it. And then I think you do get ship shipwrecked. But anyway, I believe you end up somewhere in this vicinity on the Isle of Dread. You will notice that there is only one kind of trail which leads you in this part and then comes up to this lake and then stops. And there are no other trails or roads on the map. If you come all the way up here, there is this bridge you can find. And there's this other village here. Everything else is essentially trackless. So you kind of get this, assuming that you start off, and I don't remember exactly where they put you or whether it's your choice. If you start off down here, you can have the, you you theoretically, if you get lucky and you stumble right into one of these villages, then you know this area where 
as long as you maintain yourself on this trail, you may not have to really hex crawl much. Well, just follow the trail, follow the trail, follow the trail. Well, you can follow the trail quite a ways, but then it dead ends over here. And you have to really stay on it, right? Other than that, you, you don't have this option of, well, but what about the road? But well, there is no road. You don't even really have too much of an option of, but we know where we're going. Because you kind of don't. You, you kind of have to get out there. I, I, I forget the, the, the story that you have or the little snippet that you have. I think you might have. I think there is a player-facing map. It gives you a very vague sense of, I think, something's like over here. You got to go out and you got to find it. And you got to you gotta go out, find it, find clues, find things, try to find find your way into this, into this. I think is, this is the, uh, what is it? It's a, a crater of a volcano. You got to find your way in it. So, Brian Smith says, so Todd, why hex crawl? Well, in this case... You're going to quickly in the Isle of Dread in a situation like this, assuming the player's goals are not to walk from, take a tour of the villages, walk to the lake and walk back. They have places they're going to want to get to that there are no roads or there may be very limited roads or the roads don't take them where they're going. Or maybe the roads aren't, uh, are, are not worthwhile for one reason or another. And so you must uh, bushwhack into the into the wood into the wilderness and being in the wilderness then suddenly those things up well we know vaguely where we need to go maybe we need to go west we need to go north but just in a vague sense that's really broad right so within this north whatever we decide north is that's really big or west or whatever else maybe we don't even know that much we might be like i don't know we've heard something we know it's west of the lake but we haven't found the lake yet so we need to find the lake first which someone told us off this way then we gotta find it now you're into hex crawling territory so why do you hex crawl because navigation and exploration are important those are questions the players might answer and and might must ask themselves and then answer now having the presence of roads doesn't mean that there's no hex crawling there you could have a hex crawl with roads in a situation where you have roads and the that could come up because I'm going to use an example again from Lord of the Rings. In Fellowship of the Ring, the the party meets up early on with Strider, aka Aragorn, in Bree. They need to get to Rivendell. The there, there is a road that pretty much leads not 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 right to Rivendell's door, but basically all the way there. They could take it all the way, and then at the last second, get off the road and find the valley, whatever. But basically, the road would get them 99% of the way there. But there's a problem: the Nazgul, the Nine are on that road. They have, or Aragorn imagines, which I think ends up being pretty much reality, that they've got that thing watched. It's on lockdown. So sure, take the road, but the road's going to lead you right to the people you don't want to meet. So while you could take the road and avoid the hex crawling, avoid the navigation, avoid the exploration, it's bad. So they weigh their options. They say, okay, where are we going to go? You know, there's that famous bit from the movies, the music. You know, where, where are you taking us, Master Strider? into the wild da, 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 da. and then everything goes and they end up in swamps and all these things that's that's your hex crawling. that's how you can get hex crawling from a situation where there is a road in this case if, if we were looking at tolkien the game master we were putting ourselves in our game mastery shoes what did we what did we do as game masters if we're thinking about well okay i want to hex crawl or i i'd like the party to hex crawl but they see no reason to get off the roads well what do you have there you have this reason not to take the roads you've there you've put an option or you've put a consequence on them taking the road sure take the road but the bad guys are on the road now suddenly as a party you have to think about well we could take the road and we're going to straight run straight into the bad guys and if we're going to put it in kind of gaming terms those things are i don't know they're what would we say the nazgul are they're at least like a white and we are level one Maybe we say Strider at this point is level three, level four. We'll call him a hero. We'll call him level four. You got a level four and a bunch of level ones or a bunch, three or four level ones running around, maybe taking on seven whites on horseback, some kind of demon horseback. Maybe not what we want to do. So we make the decision then to go into the wild. And as soon as we do that, then we've got our hex crawling stuff at the ready because now Sure, they're not on the road, but they have to navigate now. They have to find their own way 
because they're going to be out of eyesight, out of eye line of the road. So they can't just follow the road from a distance because that wouldn't do much good because then the Nazgul would just see them. So they have to hide behind the hills and now they have to, they don't know everything that's out there and ooh, there's all kinds of stuff. They could overshoot their mark. They can end up in the troll shaws and who knows what horrors in the troll shaws. They could get stuck in the swamps. They only have limited food and rations and there's all kinds of nasty things out there. Now I have to do that. As a GM, this only happens really when there are consequences. It doesn't always have to be danger. It could be something more straightforward, which like uh, time. I, I'm, I'm trying to think if I have a good example here. I have a couple of these Isle of Dread maps and I see, I see you get so TW, I'll, I'll check your question in a minute. There's the original Isle of Dread map. And then I got this one here from Test of the Warlords. Again, just showing you have all these places and there's really, there's not even any very few roads. I don't even know if this is a road or it's, I think it might actually be a river. What is that? Yeah, the river. There's really just these kind of trade routes and, and you know, figuring out all this stuff. But the uh, time may be a factor. So you imagine a situation in which you need to move from A to B. We have to get from, and I'm going to use the Breed Rivendell example, even though it's not going to fit very well for what I'm saying here. We need to get from Breed to Rivendell. There's a road. Oh, great. There's a road. But this road, it's not an express. It's not an expressway. It's not a straight line. Like it kind of seems to be more or less in the books. It's not super, you know, it's not all the way straight, but it's not direct. This road's going to take us along the, you know, have you ever taken the, you ever, you ever gone, uh, been overseas, or you, depending on where you live, maybe in your, your home, or not even overseas, there's usually the highway, and then there's local roads, the ones that go along the coast, or they go in all the small towns, those are usually the oldest roads, so you imagine in the 50 years ago, 60 years ago, or whenever the highways were made, if you go back before that, and you think about, well, there, was, there wasn't this straight road from New York to Boston, it was you're going along the coast and you're zigzagging through all these little valleys and and in every little town and doing all, all that nonsense to get to Boston. What's a four hour just hit the freeways and you get on it is like an eight hour marathon. So now imagine that okay, well we can get from Rivendell to Bree, but this thing's gonna take us through every little hamlet. It's gonna be going taking the path of least resistance winding around over there it's going to take us two weeks even trying to go as fast as possible on this road or it's going to take us five days if we cut across but if we cut across there's a lot of things we don't know including the navigational aspects and on top of the natural uh natural obstacles that might there might be there on top of flora and fauna that may wish to kill us and eat us and use our skins as napkins what do we do? Well, two weeks is nice, but the Nazgul are on our trail. And the most obvious thing that they're going to think, they know that we know that they know that we know that they know that we know that taking the road is, is, is the best way in terms of not getting lost to get the Rivendell. So they're going to be on that road like, you know, flies on ish. So we got to do the thing that's unexpected, the place, take the trail or take the, the, the method that's going to get the least likelihood of us getting caught into the wild, Master Gamgee. But the, you got to have that consequence there. If you if there are no consequences, much like a lot of other tests we do in games, if there are no consequences, don't do it. There's no consequences for, the, that involved with getting from A to B that it's kind of a fait accompli, especially if they have all the time in the world to do it. Then you start to ask yourself, well, why are we doing it, right? Danger is obviously certainly a consequence. But these other, you know, time, danger, resources, all these things. If you're on kind of a pleasure walk and you can take as much time as you want and food is plentiful, plentiful, then a lot of the things kind of fall fall away, right? There's no risk to getting lost because you have in, in I'm I'm gonna just gonna just hang around here until I, I find my way again. Like like Gandalf sniffing the and sniffing the tunnels in uh under the mountain. Um in the uh, uh, Casa Doom. We are getting the, uh, let's see, some of the questions here. Uh, 
Let's see, Wancho says, talking about, I think, back to the Isle of Dread. Starts with the PCs finding a partial map and an account of a fabulous treasure, right? The partial map, and yeah, the PC map is empty in the interior, right? That's right. And then, um, and on the island, you can find, yes, there are lots of side quests, and finding those and, 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 and finishing them, completing them, also means you got to kind of get off the beaten path. Uh, Gitso TW says, any tips for map tools and random encounter tables ready to go? Uh, D30 Sandbox Companion Gitso, uh, which I covered. You can search for my video on that if you wanted me to see me. Check it out before you plunk down any monies on drive through has lots of lots of tables i mean the original books expert the basic and expert sets have tables the expert set in particular has tables for random encounters or wandering monsters for your hex crawls mapping tools there's tons of free ones out there i like worldographer for creating uh, any scale of hex map you want with the kind of classic symbology the Adam Nelson men mentions getting lost, but I'm not sure. I think I might have lost the cops what he was referring back to, but yes, getting lost is 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 one of the reasons why you might want to use you might want to hex crawl. Brian Smith says the idea of a hex crawl to Samwise must be downright befuddling. Dudes never hex crawl further than the Shire. Exactly. I mean, and that's kind of the thing, right? That's kind of the interesting thing from a both a potentially a player and a character aspect about having to engage with it. It is, it is something kind of new and different and scary in a different way like i try to impress upon my players that you know you're going out in the wilderness it's not a it's not a cakewalk you can run into a dragon which they recently have uh, as easily as you might you know as often you might run into something else so you want to be careful when we get out there you want to kind of hustle and yeah that means getting lost and being inefficient in your travel much like being inefficient in the dungeon has can have real real consequences and you have less control over because in the dungeon you might look and say we're only on the first floor assuming we're using kind of classic dungeon stalking stalking not stalking like a stalker dungeon stalking procedures so we might think well for the most part grand there's always a chance of something really nasty coming but we've read the lay of the land so we know what the creatures that actually inhabit this level are like and we know that mostly the other creatures wandering through are going to be at a certain level. So you might feel a certain amount of comfort. You don't have that in the wild. Something's going to come at you might be, might be more numerous or just bigger, stronger, faster. And there's not necessarily anywhere to run. You get caught in the open plains and, and a red dragon's just coming down at you with fire, you know, rising in its mouth, getting ready to breathe. And it's 120 feet above your head's, at this moment, um, unless you're barred with a special arrow, chances are like you're just kind of toast or just save well. Hopefully you'll just save really well. You're, you're some kind of decent enough level and it decides to leave. You're toast. So that's a big risk you take when you just start kind of wandering, wandering around outdoors. So there's a real tension when you're out there looking for stuff. <laughs> Juan Cholo says, Mr. Frodo, we're being chased by wraiths. No problem, Sam. We'll just get a cleric. But Mr. Frodo, the DM doesn't allow clerics in this campaign. Uh-oh. <laughs> very, very right. And Terrence says, Sam was a 10th level landscaper. He might have been. He might have been. Oval Team Patrol mentions, if you're doing actual timekeeping, then opportunities can be tied to specific dates. We want to make the summer tourney. We have to get to the capital within the month. E exactly. The, yes. If you're wondering, if we go from answering the question of why are we hex crawling, which would be the answer is because we're in a situation, getting back to my little list here, which in a situation when exploration and navigation questions need answering. So in the sense of what we're saying, why are we hex crawling instead of point crawling? If we're point crawling, it means we navigation and exploration aren't, are not questions we need to answer, just efficiency of travel, just speed and overcoming whatever obstacles are still important, but not the, not actually finding where we're going. But why are we doing, why are we bothering maybe with travel anyway, is that, yeah, time is a factor. We don't have enough time to just take the slow boat and just go our merry way and take the, as much security and resources and everything else. We're going to go super slow, but we're going to go in metal tanks that nothing can, you know, that are impervious to everything. And we're going to go, and we're only going to travel the hours between noon and four o'clock. And otherwise that we're going to turtle up and, and put magic force fields around us and so nothing can harm us. Well, how long is it going to take you to get from Bree to Rivendell like that? Two years, but nothing will stop us, right? Then, okay. But 
yeah and when you have to start dealing with time hey we only we only have so many weeks and as the gm and your players will probably help you with this is push the time don't give them all the time in the world i mean if it's up to you then make time a factor if 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 you're the question might be i want to hex crawl but how do i get my party to embrace it which i think is another thing that often comes up in the kind of why are we hex crawling maybe question two is how how can i get them to hex crawl uh the how can uh how how i can how can i maybe encourage a hex crawl does that does that work for what we're doing if we get to, if we if we make this kind of our maybe a secondary question then make time a factor and 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 shorten it put them put it you know, like everything else we're trying to up, I, I always think about when I'm trying to make decisions, this is just a general thing. And my, my party has kind of caught on to it a bit when they made mention of how so much, so much things seem to happen to them. Like, like they've, they've, they've succumbing to Murphy's law. You know, they, 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 they do hard, you know, they, they, so, you know, they tried to sort of enslave and dominate this one crazy guy crazy guy in the woods how does that one crazy guy turn out to be somebody well you know what you know murphy's law or maybe now they're calling it more of todd's laws that this is the guy that would come back to bite them in the butt i mean granted in the moment he did say he was a a, a wizard or a magic user and all these things so it's not like he just was nobody absolutely but you know why does that end up being the guy that's doing this stuff well I want, if I have the choice between several things I could do, if I'm rolling dice and I get something like NPC becomes a pain in the butt. Oh, well, which NPC am I going to use? I'm going to pick for the one that to me ratchets things up a notch, takes that, take that crank and turn it up. I want to get that tension up. I want to get, get the, get that spring wound tighter. So by the same token, if a messenger comes for the party, like to use the example that, uh, let's see. What was that? Was it? Uh, yeah, Oval Team Patrol mentioned. We a messenger comes with a letter from the uh, local lord or the duke. Come to my summer summer tourney that I'm holding at Castle. Oh. Well, I could say, oh, when do we get this letter? When's the summer tourney? Oh, it's in three months. Perfect. We have all the time in the world. No. No, if I if it's it's just up to me, then instead what I might say is, well, the messenger had a hard time finding you, which makes sense. You guys have been adventuring, you've been running around, you've been hiding from, you've been hiding from these same messengers because other people have been trying to trying to get you to get to pay your back taxes, or you killed their niece, or you you ran over their favorite dog, or whatever you've done. So no, you're finding it late. In fact, this point that maybe the messenger had given up and been turning around to come back only happened to be in the local tavern getting one last drink before they get on their pony and ride their pony express back to where they came from when you guys happen to stumble in. And so they said, oh my gosh, finally you're here. I don't know if this helps you or not, but you know, you've been summoned to the winter summer tourney. I couldn't find you though. So, oh yeah, by the way, it's happening. It's happening in four days. And you know, I won't even, I'm not even going to make it there in time because Taking the uh, taking the old the King's Road over to the his summer castle is about an eight day trip, and then you look on the map, or if they if they have a map they look at it, or they can even ask around, or they can ask you, and you say, oh well, uh, really are we kind of stuck? And you might say, well, if you take the road, sure, it's an eight day trip, but you can you could cut across the Dragon's Tooth Mountains. Or the the troll hills, and um, yeah, people have made that trip in three or four days. Don't ask how many of those people survived. <laughs> the people who survived the trip, being in three or four days, eh, most of them don't survive. But you got a chance. Now the party has an option: they can arrive late, or decide not to go at all and live with the consequences of that, or they could try to race race ahead of the road, you know, get, get, get off the road, 
race across and still make it there by the opening tilt. They may not take you up in the hex crawl. And I think you got to live with that as it's a GM, just like anything else. When you're preparing your dungeons and you've got all sorts of great stuff behind door number one and they decide not to go through door number one, you just kind of got to live with it. Okay. Maybe next time. And the same thing with the hex crawl. If, if they don't, uh, if they don't bite and they say, ah, we're just going to take the slow road anyway. Maybe we'll run into a wizard on the side of the road with a teleportation, teleportation, mass teleport spell that they want to donate to the cause. And we'll do that. Otherwise we'll just, we'll come late and we'll just live with it. Then, okay, live with it. And just make sure that whatever living with the, it means in terms of consequences are meaningful. Uh, let's see. Dungeon Master Masterclass says, your name suggests that hex crawling is specifically and specially important to me. How much of that is true, and how much is it that you just thought of a cool name with hex, with hex in it? I uh, so Dungeon Master Masterclass. That is a a fair a fair point. Let me get a swig of what is this? Blackberry Spinner for the working man. I need to get a little bit of lubrication for my throat. All right. Yes, hex is in my name. Um, I do really enjoy what are you showing me here oh thanks microsoft edge uh yes hex hex is in my name i've always been i've always been uh in love with maps not even just hex maps though certainly the first ones you know i had isle of dread kind of in the beginnings of my one of the first things i had when i got into the hobby was keep on the borderlands and isle of dread from the basic and expert boxes i just love those maps I love the freedom that those maps entail. I love the kind of mystery of wondering what's going on in these different locations. And just that um, that freeform ability they have just to kind of go anywhere and see anything. I don't know if, if this will be meaningful to a lot of folks. I think probably some, because I, I, I think that a fair amount of my audience, for good or bad, is not in the spring of their lives, to say <laughs> to be to be kind and gentle. There were the Ultima games back in the day on i had a commodore 64 ultima ultima one two three four i think were the big ones and depending if you came up across a little bit later there was also ultima underworld and there was this is even this is well before ultima online and that kind of thing but the ultima games were amazing and one of the things that was amazing about that i never even got that far narratively into those games but i spent hours hours just getting lost because you could do anything you wanted you could go anywhere which meant that you could end up in situations where you're way over your head and i remember being <laughs> oh my gosh i don't even remember what i'd done oh i i remember using they had these moon gates i think they had them in all the ultimates but particularly in ultima 4 you had these moon gates and you could just you could just be wandering around the map and, and i remember one time i'm wandering around this map and it and it maps weren't hex maps they were kind of these kind of pixel maps and this moon gate opens up and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go through it. I don't know where it's going. And it took me, and I, I think this character, this setup I had, I, I kind of liked, I'd done a few things. I'd gotten some good stuff. I went through this moon gate, I ended up in part of the map that was just way outside my pay grade at the time. And this is like, I, 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 it would be the equivalent of in a dungeon crawl. I'm on level two or three of the dungeon and I find a mysterious portal. And I get, it's a one-way portal and it drops me off at like level 12 of the dungeon. So you imagine you're going from the stuff that you can handle or is even maybe a little bit on the easy side for you till you're running from everything. Now in Ultima, you can run because you'll see stuff will appear on the map generally depending on, I, I'm sure it was making, uh, it was uh, making calculations behind the screen, but you might not, you could kind of run away. And even if you got into sort of combat, you could kind of run. So I, I just remember, I don't even know if I ever got that character out of it, just running because stuff was showing up ettins and things like that i had no i i had no i had no hope again so it was just a matter of how much how long can i survive hopefully find another moon gate so i can get the heck out of dodge because i don't know where i am even in relation to the rest of the world I, i'm i'm just out of it but this concept of this wide open world you can go wherever i just i just always always loved it and someone pointed out in a comment to one of my other videos on this that what they things that draw them to tabletop role playing games that there really is endless possibilities. You know, you play on a computer game, it's fine, but there's always going to be some sort of 
barrier that you get to. Maybe not spatially. Maybe you're going to be in some like Minecraft where you can just go anywhere in the world. But then there's always going to be something you want to do that you can't do that they didn't think about that they decided. You know what? This is enough. Like we're going to you can do all these things, but you can't do this or that. And t- tabletop games you know, don't have that, right? And 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 to me, the kind of sandbox hex crawl play is really the epitome of really you can engage or not with anything. There's always another town <laughs> over the horizon if you want to go. There's always something else going on and then making all these videos and trying to do this stuff is really to help people engage with that in a way that's not super frustrating because if you're planning things in a very linear way yeah it's supremely annoying when someone decides to just kind of jump off onto a crazy train and go in some perpendicular direction that has nothing that you've done out there and they're kind of like why are you derailing this whole thing we're doing but if you're doing kind of open world sandboxy hex quality stuff then you just you can roll with it you know i don't know if i'm on the isle of dread gonna zoom in here maybe i planned and i know i did this when i ran it as a one shot maybe i planned for the party is going to follow the trail to the lake and then i have some event that's going to happen at the lake and that's going to give them some pointer but you know what they decide these hills over here look nice Ooh, swamp i love swamp and they deviate but i've got the tools I've got the me- mechanisms that if they do that, I'm not just totally flummoxed. I can I can roll with it. And then I can even do things like when I'm rolling stuff that is quote unquote random behind the scene, I know all these other things that are going on. Maybe I can tie it back in here. Maybe I can make it work. Maybe I can figure out how to tie in. Well, if they're running, if they were supposed to meet a, a friendly lizard man tribe by the lake, but now I've rolled a random encounter with lizard men out in the swamps. Maybe those those same lizard men, maybe they live out in the swamps. Maybe they live in this number 35 out here. And they just did a point where they're meeting up early. So even though they were supposed to meet here, now they meet over here. For one example, it could be anything. Maybe it's something completely different. Maybe they meet another faction that's coming to kill the lizard men. But now the party run into them first. Who knows? But I can kind of find these things to run with it. And I, I really enjoy that. It's something I really really love about uh, games is doing that and so yeah that's that's kind of was my first i mean certainly the earliest some of the earliest videos on the channel i think that i did were stuff on hex crawling and then stuff on bx kind of the things that sort of are still my maybe my go-to loves in the game from then until now uh gizto gizzo says uh, that they recently found out about the Hexcrawl and it's amazing. Can't wait to play this with my group. The structures travel so nicely from a DM's perspective. Absolutely. The thing is, get so, which is often the, the challenge, like we've been talking about someone here, is you got all these tools from the GM's perspective. Now, how do you get your players to buy in? Because there's some players that they're not going to be used to it. One thing you can do is talk to them about it. Out of character. Talk to your players. Oh, we'll see about the possibilities. Did I spell that right? I must have, because I'm not getting little squiggly lines. Talk to your players about it. I will talk to my players very openly, early on, and often about. A lot of things aren't going to be spoon fed to you. You're going to have to go out and find stuff, find rumors, find, you know, once you have a rumor, find out where it takes place. And you're not going to find a lot of trails, roads, and big neon signs that are saying, here is the place. So you're going to have to get out there and, and, and do that and try to live with the dangers, try to mitigate the dangers where you can. And you're going to have to take some chances. You're going to have to do that. And so far with the groups I've played with, having that in mind, they've been willing to do that depending on what system and how the players have been other games they've been played, how they've been playing them, that may be a hard sell, a soft sell, maybe a no go in some cases. If it's a no go, something you want to do direction you want to take your game, but they don't, you got to kind of figure that out. I think maybe you can kind of sneak it in somewhere. I think sometimes not, not putting it out there. It's like, I don't, I don't tell my players you're going to hex crawl and here's how hex crawling works. I just say things like, There are places you're going to want to get to that you're not going to know exactly where they are. You're going to have to trek out in the wilderness and find them. Here are the kinds of things in the wilderness you're going to have to deal with. Navigation, 
you know, uh, finding the actual exploration to find stuff, navigating to places, dealing and, and, and the very dangerous things that are out there. But oh, by the way, you can run to a lot of cool stuff, maybe stuff that nobody even knows about. Some stuff might even be an easy win for you as a group if you can find. And who knows what kind of treasures and possibilities that you might find out there, but you're going to have to get out there and find them, right? I don't, I don't push it as we're going to hex crawl. No, I just say, you're going to have to, you're going to have to test yourselves into the wilderness at some point to make stuff happen. You can also do this if you're, I think a lot of games, not necessarily my cup of tea, but a lot of games people will talk about, you know, well, players have come to me and say, I'd like to, my player's a polearm specialist. Can I find a polearm magic item? Well, sure you can, but you might have to go and find it. Maybe you have to find rumors of where a great polearm master was buried or, or has lived still or has a school, and then you have to find it, and then you have to get there. These are all kind of hex crawly kind of things once you get into the finding of it and getting there. And so maybe you slip that in there. Now it's now that now this particular player has a reason to maybe think about going into the in the wilderness outside of the roads, taking those less traveled trails and tracks or having to make their own trail or track. And then maybe they can convince other party members too, or maybe you can weave in other things for other party members. But I don't think it's bad to talk to your players about it, but I just don't put it in terms of calling it a hex crawl. I don't care if my players ever know that when they're out there moving across the wilderness that it is a hex crawl. It doesn't matter to me at all. I'm fine with them not knowing. I might even prefer that they don't know. I, I just want them to understand the sort of risks and rewards of trekking through the wilderness and then reasons why they may want might want to do it, either specifically because of what's happening in terms of the fiction of the game as we're playing or because of things like there's something I want specifically that's out there. Uh, Juan Chola says, The Wilderlands of High Fantasy setting reprinted by Necromancer, yeah, Necromancer Games has some gonzo random encounter charts. All those things, all the old Judges Guild stuff has crazy gonzo things. Uh, I, I Unfortunately, I, I wish I could recommend Judges Guild stuff at the moment, but I can't. For reasons I'm not going to get into, I just, I can't. Can't do it. But I think some of that is, some of that feeling is captured in, say, the D30, uh, D30, uh, what is it called? D30 Hexcrawl Companion. And there's another D30 book of tables. Got a whole bunch of stuff in there. But yeah, they, there's a lot of fun. And, it, you know, it's a little bit, um, your miles may vary because if if you if you want to, th- th- some of them airs maybe of being a little bit more gonzo than your, maybe your style or not gonzo enough. So you might need to tweet them. But they're definitely good starting points for seeing just kind of the, the width and breadth of things that they can, you can pop into your wilderness if you so choose. Terrence says second breakfast should be on the random encounter table. The party finds an IHOP lose 1D4, 1D4 hours. Or yeah, if you wanted to go kind of more fairy things, the I, IHOP is run by one of those witches, kind of a Hansel and Gretel hop. Hans hop? I Hans, maybe? Gitzo asks me if I mainly play a sorcerer. No, I don't think I've, I've played... Uh, no, I've, I've played a bunch of classes. I don't think I ever played in a game where I actually had to, to play a sorcerer by name. I've played magic users. I've played paladins. I've played rangers. I've played thieves, magic user thieves, fighter, magic user thieves. Those are, even though the, the progression when you get to the fighter, magic user thief stuff is really slow. There is something kind of fun about just having a whole bunch of toys. I played some custom classes. I don't think I ever played something that was a sorcerer, but... Uh, this NPC in my campaign, Bogwig, is definitely, uh, I've had fun playing him, and he would be the closest, I think, to a sorcerer. Elfbait, hello, Elfbait, says, a DM can also do a lot to telegraph and pre- prepare players for big encounters. A dragon in the area might leave telltale, telltales, I think telltale signs, or, or just tales. And the village is often uh, not the sort of thing that just appears out of nowhere. Yeah, and if they are, and if you are, you're rolling up, and I and at this also came up in a question, right? When someone says, "Well, you know, the, the kind of rolling layers when you're rolling wandering and counter checks is kind of weird." If you want to have this this village show up, then it should be like weird, like that's that kind of strangeness of, "Ooh, why is this weird village here that no one's heard about and seems to be no trace of it, but there it's there." Like, is this Shangri La? Is this the village of the damned? Why? Why is this? Why is this here? And also things in terms of, um, I'll just add this in here. Um, highlight, you know, negative consequences 
around conventional travel. I'm not saying that you have to make your roads super deadly to get people to get off of them. But if you put dangers on the roads, like in the Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, yeah, you could take the road. The Nazgul are there. Do you still want to take the road? Maybe we don't. Time, you know, that could be, maybe there's, you know, armies are going to use roads. Maybe you're trying to get ahead of an army to warn somebody that they're coming. Taking the road, while it might be a bit faster, the army is also sending their scouts and things and spies on that road. So you might get tagged, captured, or at least stopped or observed. Whereas if you take the wilderness, chances are if you make it through there, they're not going to see you coming that direction. So show your players. If your players are just super, uh, you know, they just always on the road, then assume. And, and the other thing is take away some of the roads. Some places don't have to have good passable roads all the time. Roads, especially when we're dealing with dealing your kind of ye old medieval situation, roads can get flooded out, washed out, blocked by other caves, just totally wiped away. Some places may only have roads that are visible seasonally because you're, you're trying, they're like small villages that only go in and, and deal with anybody else at certain times of year. If, it, if you're traveling in the winter, they may just get snowed up and you just can't find them. They can get flooded out seasonally. Lots of things you can do to make the roads, not only make them more difficult or more time consuming, because, oh sure, we've got eight or 10 miles of this road that are all muddy and, and, you know, people are taking them forever and carts are stuck on there and you're going to be waiting in a line, but time is a factor. And sure, you could, you know, the party might say, oh, we're just going to go 10 feet off the road. It's like, that's a whole muddy mess too. Where do you think all these track, all these different carts and things like you're going to have to go far out of your ways to get out of this mud pit and then you might get lost. Then you might need to find a new track or trail, something else. <coughs> Excuse me. And don't, you know, you don't have to have roads also that go everywhere the party wants to go. Sometimes, you know, you can't get there from here. Gary Khan was this past weekend. I was not at Gary Khan. Maybe next year. Part of the difficulty is even this day and age is getting from New York City to Gary Khan. There's not really a direct way, as I understand, to get there. Some people have mentioned there's a direct flight. I hear other things saying there's no direct flights. A couple of years ago when I looked, there were no direct flights. So it's all about, well, you got to get here. Then you got to drive there and you got to get there. All these different things, and sure, I can get there on sort of settled, well-paved roads and whatnot, but that might be something where I go, you know, instead, I want to try the drive across country. Oh, it's in the Midwest. I'm just going to drive through cornfields till I get there. Well, I can, I can try. I can try it. Ender Arcanian, hello, Ender, says, small question, but what program or site am I using for my presentation? This uh, this right here is Ouija, W-E-J-E. -E. I don't know if it's pronounced Ouija or Wee or something else. Uh, it's basically like, um, what's what I use, Miro and some other tools. It's been pretty good. They had a, a lifetime, they had a lifetime, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, account sale a bit ago. Uh, is it, and, and, you know, companies do this. There are a couple of sites, AppSumo, if you ever AppSumo, and another one's called Dealify. We'll post these deals that last for a couple of weeks or a month, sometimes even a couple of months, where you can get kind of lifetime deals to sort of new and upcoming software and online applications. It's a way for these, the makers, to get an influx of cash and to incentivize you a lot. Oftentimes they put together these, these lifetime deals so that you can get in here and assuming that the software stays out there for some number of years, instead of having to pay monthly, you're in it for free. So I got on this one. I was on Miro, on the free plan of Miro. Miro worked very well. It's Miro, I would say from just a feature standpoint, is a lot of bells and whistles that Ouija doesn't have yet. Hopefully they'll get there. But I was finding myself constrained by only having three boards I could use. And it was just getting to be a little bit of a pain. So I was looking for something that it could be a little more extensible for me. And so I, I found uh, Ouija, if that's the right word. And uh, yeah, I ponied up for the deal. It was usually they're a pretty good discount too, in terms of the the pricing is usually not bad. And I got on it. But as far as what it's giving me now, I'm pretty happy with it. I really like these different things where you can kind of you really have this kind of you can really zoom in and out and have this massive board. So hopefully that answers your question, Ender. 
Juan Cholo says, Lewis and Clark expedition, another historical example of a hex crawl. Have Duke so and so hire the players to explore some new lands that have been found. Yep, I've done that. That was that was one of the first missions I gave uh one set of players, and that was kind of part of their overall mission statement was exploring. And that's another thing. Make exploration uh, a central part of the game. And by the way, um, incentivize it. Incentivize it. What's the word I'm looking for? Make exploration a central activity and incentivize it. I have done, you know, XP for hexes, you know, traveled or explored. You know, give them something. And you can scale it up. The nice thing is with the hex maps is I'm going to let me zoom in here on the Isle of Dread again. And we're at the bottom of the hour, so I'm going to be wrapping it up momentarily. So, for instance, let's just say that your party is headquartered. Where's a good? Let's just say. Oh, well, let's call it here. They're headquartered here. And you are trying to incentivize the players to ex to do this exploration out here or even beyond. So you can say something that, okay, the trail, those are explored. There's a trail there that's established. You're not going to get any credit for marching up and down the trail. But for exploring, and we can you can say that, okay, we have, we're going to have two things. We're going to have traveled. You've moved through the hex. Maybe you get some experience for moving through the hex, some number. And then there's exploring, which is, say, finding the one unique thing, the landmark, if you will. If we're talking about, like a lot often folks do with hexes, they put kind of one interesting thing or maybe notable is better than this. I have to be, ooh, is it interesting? Maybe, maybe not, but it's notable thing in the hex. Then finding that would then mean that you've basically explored the hex. You kind of, you know it. You may not be able to find your way in it in the dark, but you've, you've kind of, you've, you've been through it enough that you've sort of identified it. So they say, okay, we're going. I'm going to keep very low numbers, just for the mathematical purposes. You can extend this however you like, but you could say something. Okay, if you travel through a hex, you're going to get one experience point, and I will multiply that by the distance that hex is from something else that is already explored or or, or known. So you're at the village. You go here with this one. You're not getting points for. If you go through this hex, instead of taking the the road here if you go into this jungle hex just traveling through it you'll get one experience point because it's one away from the road if you were to then go over to this one you would get two experience points because it's two away for or it's you know uh two away from the road one two if you explore this that would be two two experience points two one away from the road if you explore this one and this was not explored first further away you get four Multiply those numbers so they make sense for you. But what you can do is you can really incentivize your players saying, look, I want to do hex crawling. Exploration is a, and, and I won't even say to your players, I want to do hex crawling. I would say, listen, exploration and these and, and doing uh, expeditions, I want to make a central part of the campaign. It's something I'm interested in. I think you guys will like it too. So to help with that, in addition to getting explore, ex, you know, XP for treasures you find and bring back to a settled place. I'm also going to give you experience for locations that you travel through or survey and you will, and how this scale will work is the, 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 the further away from your home base or from the safety of sort of known lands you go and explore, the more it's going to be worth. And you can adjust those numbers, however they fit in for you. But that might also get players who might normally just be like, ah, I just want to take the road to the road. Might suddenly be like, ooh, just going out and checking this place out. Again, fudge the numbers. Let's just say that's a thousand experience points. We go and explore that one hex. That's worth it to me. That's half a level, maybe. Even if we don't find any treasure, that makes it something that, ooh, now I want to go and explore those. And of course, the more they explore, then they got to push out further to explore to keep getting experience. You might have them all of a sudden want to just become cartographers and travel across the map exploring. You can make that an option, but you, you know, you just have to kind of, you got to kind of, you, you might have to nudge them a bit, right? Don't, I mean, you know, don't have to railroad them because again, if I say that you can get this, you can get experience points through exploration, I'm not saying that they have to. Whoops. 
get out there. But I'm saying that they can. It's still in their hands. So totally up to them. But it's incentivized in a way that may help them weigh it as an option. Juan Cholo says, or maybe a wealthy merchant wants to find a shortcut to another city slash country and hires the players to find a new route. Yeah, you want to, you, you know, merchant A wants to be able to get their wares faster to the town than merchant B. Find us a path through. Or, uh, you know, there are now bandits holed up in the mountain pass. I can't dislodge them. It's too big for you. And I don't even want you to mess with them. What I want you to do is find me an alternate path through the mountains. I've heard there's one out there, but I can't find it. You find it for me. Elfbait says, for a frontier campaign I want to run, the ticking clock is the weather. It's set in a cold northern setting. There are only so many months you can safely travel. And then Elfbait also says, Ultima Games, my heart. Yes. And ooh, and Elfbait says, do you remember Seven Cities of Gold on the 64? I do remember. Wandering blindly through the South American jungle in search of Cities of Gold. Yep, I remember. I remember very much. Those, those were fun too. I hadn't even thought about that until just now. Hey, Michael Link or Linky. Sorry about that, but appreciate that. Wancho says, I remember trying to map the original Legend of Zelda game and some of the dungeons. I always had the, uh, whatever the Nintendo power that had that stuff in it, or the, 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 whatever the, the, the cheat book at some point. And then, uh, oh, Elfie says, luckily we have the pancake house. Yes, very much so. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I know we're, we're at the hour. I got to run. I'm sure other folks got to run. Um, let me see if there's any other questions or comments, and then we'll give this one a wrap. Elfbase says, another YouTuber was posting and said that road travel slash commerce could be as much as eight times as expensive as sea travel, for example. I, you possibly could. I mean, there's a lot you can factor in there, especially when at the beginning of your campaigns and your PCs are hopefully pretty dirt poor, that having to travel along the roads stay in stay in inns and things because you can't just sleep out in the streets that won't that won't do uh and it takes a long time right that that's that kind of a resource puzzle that you want to want to do here is uh i should probably put that in. it's really uh i'll put this in here because really time and resources that's part of that resource puzzle hey i only have so much i only got so much food i can't take a 12-day tour I only got four days of food. I'm not a great hunter. And if we waste time hunting, maybe we'll get some, maybe we won't. I don't have money to pay these guys if we go back to town. I got to find a dungeon. Or I got to find something. I can't just go robbing people. That's not going to work very well. So yeah, I got I to gotta find a spot. I got to find, uh, find something to go. And then Michael asked if that was Dungeon Masterpiece. I haven't looked at their stuff. Somebody else pointed me in their way. I'll have to check it out. Um... Michael says that he uh, applies real world economics and geopolitics to D&D in addition to good general purpose DM advice. That's cool. Uh, let's see. Elfbase says, but yeah, traveling along known routes can be dangerous or maybe you just don't want to telegraph your routes to travel. Yes, that's the other thing, right? Um, how much do you, you know, is secrecy important? Is, You can definitely play up the fact that when you're traveling along these main roads, words of your word of your arrival is going to get ahead, going to travel ahead of you, potentially to both those you may want to know and particularly those you may not want to know. So how do you avoid that? Well, get off the darn roads. Talking about his wilderness frontier, up it says it has a magical resource that's creating a sort of gold rush in a cold, temperate region all of the Yukon. That sounds really cool. Really cool. And Brian Smith says HXP. Not sure what that means other than Hexpress may be abbreviated, but thanks very much. All right, folks. So I hope you guys found this interesting. Shall I? We can bottom line this in the end. I think there was a lot even still that we could continue to cover. But why are we hex crawling? We are hex crawling because exploration and navigation are important. We either the roads don't go where we're going. We have reasons not to use the roads. We got to go off road. Whatever the reason is, why are we hex crawling? Ultimately, it's because we need to engage with exploration and navigation. And then if you have situations that you could have that, but you're trying to get your players to embrace it or at least look at it as an option because they might not even make time and resources factors. Don't make roads the quickest, easiest, cheapest ways to get places. Someone mentioned the dungeon masterclass may have mentioned, but yeah, play up. Look, there are costs. 
you're traveling on roads, you have to pay tolls. And not all tolls are going to be bank robbers. A lot of tolls are by the state, collecting tolls, another taxes, staying in inns, going slowly. Do they have the food? Do they have the money? Do they have the time? Do all this stuff. If you play up the fact that they don't, and by the way, you're the GM, you're creating this world. Don't just give them all the time in the world. Play up the tensions. Make them have to have to take these questions into account. Don't just give them all the time. Say, you know what? I'm going to give you less time. Now, now this becomes an option, whereas before it was very easy to say, take the road. Mention the negative consequences. Make it open them. You know, talk about how, hey, if you go this way, these are the things that could go wrong. Play up the fact that maybe things like secrecy of movements could be important, and that might be a reason to stay off the roads. Make exploration a central activity. Mention it. Talk to your players about it. This is a, something that we're going to be dealing with a lot in this campaign, and also incentivize it. Put it as a source of experience points and come up with a system that will make it more of an option. If they're weighing, well, we don't. We only need to find treasure, then maybe exploration and we want to avoid it. And there are good reasons to avoid it because it's super dangerous. But if you add exploration in the mix and say, well, I'm going to reward you for taking on these potentially extra dangers, then they may weigh it a little bit differently. And then Terrence says, can't we just go robbing people? You can. You can always go robbing people. But I don't give experience or treasure for robbing people. Um, but your game, your game, your rules, Terrence. So you do you. Krister says it was definitely interesting. Thanks a lot. Sure, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Oh, gaining hex XP for exploring or HXP. Ah, I got you. Ah, that's cool. Hex XP. I like it. All right, folks. Well, on that note, I'm gonna let you go. I hope you hope you enjoy this. Hope it was you, more importantly, well, not more important than you enjoyed it. Hope it was useful to you if you give a thumbs up on your way out that would be awesome if you find yourself in here watching this and you liked it and you're not subscribed if you could subscribe that would also be awesome it lets the algorithms over in the tubes to know that i'm putting out good work and so that they will recommend me to other people looking for this kind of stuff you would be surprised even though i'm most well known for these kind of hex crawl videos how many folks search for hex crawling and don't find my stuff so any any bit can help um that's all i've got thanks again michael for becoming a member and uh, I will talk to everyone later, so game on. Cheers, everybody.